Welcome everyone, I'm Moira Stiles and I'm the president of the Targa Settlers Association, which by now you'll know because I say that every meeting. Now I'm going to start off with Jude, our administrator. We've got a few outings coming up and events, so she's just going to give us an update so you all know where we are, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Jude. Righty-ho. Um, so hopefully everybody already knows about the summer outing bus trip that we have coming up. We still have some spaces available if anybody wants to join us. So we're going on a fossil trail and we'll be going up to, I always want to call it the lost world, but it's not the lost world. Um, it's the forgotten world up at Duntroon. So if anybody wants to do that, they can just give me a yell. Otherwise, the things you don't know about yet, which all the information will be coming out in your newsletter, we're actually having a garden party at Olveston in March, and there's also going to be a screening of part of the Journey to New Edinburgh documentary. So that's for the 175th anniversary for Dunedin and the 125th anniversary for the OSA. So all that information will come out with your newsletter, but if you want any information before then, just come find me and I'll talk more. Cool. Oh, that's going to the news. Thank you, Jude. Well, today's speaker is someone that I've wanted to hear again. I heard her speak just briefly at the Targa Art Society, and I was just so, so interested. So I suggested she would be another speaker for us, and I'm just really thrilled you're here today. And I see you've got all your musical instruments, well, maybe not all of them. So we've got <laughs> Dr. Jennifer Catamol, who's been playing, learning, and teaching about, I can't say this properly, to Onga Parora. Oh, wow. Um, traditional Maori instruments. So she's going to talk to us and give us demonstrations and we're hands on. And there's a real renaissance of this at the moment. And I know during the Arts Festival, there was just a magnificent performance at the um, cathedral. And I went to that and I just thought when they're flying the one around the head, if we let go, we'd all be decapitated. <laughs> but it was very, very good and it was just lovely. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Maura. So, one, welcome. Um, it's, a, it's an absolute thrill and an honour to be here, so thank you very much for having me. Um, just a quick note, um, if anybody who's seated down the back would prefer to come up front, please do. Um, you'll be able to see better, if, I mean, you should be able to hear me okay, but please, if you'd like to come a little closer, I'm, I'm not that scary, honest. Okay, so today is about taonga pōro, uh, traditional Māori musical instruments. And it's really just based around what you would like to know. So I'm going to start off with a quick karakia. And this karakia, the translation is um, something along the lines of holding fast to one's traditions and making sure that they are not lost. And I think it's particularly appropriate for taonga pōro because this is a tradition that was almost lost until it was revived 
um, sort of from the 1960s and particularly through the 1980s and, and still that's ongoing today. So the, here we go with the karakia. So tukoe te wairua kia rere ki ngā taumata, hai ārahi i a tātou mahi, me tā tātou whai ngā tikanga a rātou mā, ki a mau, ki a ita, ki a kore aengaro, ki a pupuri, ki a whakamoa, ki a tīna, tīna, huie tai ki e. Kia ora. OK, so now um, I'm actually going to throw this over to you and actually make you do some work, which is a bit naughty of me, but there we go. Um, so what I'd like you to do is, if you've come with somebody, or even if you haven't, um, if you want to turn to the people around you, maybe in pairs, groups of threes, just have a quick little natter, have a quick little chat, and see if you can come up with at least a couple of questions of things that you would like to know about these instruments that are here on the table. And then we'll go from there. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have a bit of a chinwag among yourselves. have anything really to do with sound. Uh, well, it doesn't affect the sound specifically. But for this one, for instance, uh, it's slightly cryptic, it's slightly hidden, but can anybody tell what's painted on this instrument? This is called a poi a fio fio. Yes! Yes, wood pigeon, kereru. I'm glad, glad it's obvious to at least somebody. <laughs> so, when I play this one, for me, there's a very strong relationship to Kereru. See if you can hear it. Aye? So, poi a So, uh, So, this is one that um, Tuhoi and other iwi would use to attract birds like Kereru and other birds as well uh, for hunting purposes. Because they are curious critters aren't they birds mm -hmm. and if they hear something that's in their territory that maybe they go well that's, a, that's something a bit new that's a bit different they will come and check you out um, I've actually uh, I haven't had any exper experiences of this myself but I have seen a YouTube video where somebody's been playing one of these and a tui has come along and is dive bombing the instrument <laughs> so they, they do work they're very effective 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's Poi A Field Fuel. Um, and if anybody's here in the market for a new lover, <laughs> um, then, then these are also uh, Ngati Kahumunu was one of the iwi that would, uh, you could play these to attract a lover. Mm. So there we go, I might, I might, I might get lucky yet. <laughs> This one's got two. Uh, they could have uh, ended up to about five. Right. So it's sort of more or less straight through. Put yeah. my fingers in the holes there. Yep. Did you make that? Yeah. Yeah, these ones are super easy to make. Yeah. It's not that easy to get hold of the hue, the gourds down here. Um, I managed to grow some once, one year in a, in a greenhouse, which is pretty, pretty awesome. But most of these ones, um, I got lucky at Hayman's auction house. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a box of gourds and I was lucky to pick up some there. Um, otherwise, um, ones like this. Uh, so this is a, a gourd trumpet, or um, puhue. And uh, so this, there are, there are accounts of these from Taranaki, and also further up north in Tamaki Makoto in Auckland. <coughs> and uh, this one's a little wee bit different to how they're described in the literature that you, you do with what you can with what you're working with, right? So the original one, this wasn't straight, this bit here. The original ones are described as that, that neck being more curved, but they do have a wooden mouthpiece a little bit like this. So these are puhue, and uh, for me, I just, I just looked at the shape and went, I can see a whale in that. <laughs> So it became a way. <laughs> Shall we have a listen? Yeah. They're quite effective, aren't they? Yep. I mean, the, the gourd instruments are usually soft and gentle and, and sweet and beautiful because that's, that's the voice of Hine Putahue, goddess of gourds and goddess of peace. And yet we saw an instrument like this as well, showing perhaps another side to Hine Putahue. So that one was a whale. A um, couple of others here. So this is called a kuowo waha, or um, a mouth blown gourd. And uh, I've already mentioned briefly about Hine Putahue, who's goddess of gourds, goddess of peace. So um, the story behind that, or one of the, one of the korero around that, is around the time of the separation of Rangi and Papa, the, the primeval parents, um, there was quite a lot of dissent. There were some of the children that really didn't want those parents to be separated. Tawhiri Mateya being kind of chief among them, god of the winds. And uh, so basically, you're gonna, uh, I mean, our, our North Island friends at the moment are very much experiencing the power of Tawhiri Mateya, unfortunately. Um, Hine Putahue took that anger, maybe we need more gourds up there at the moment, anyway she took all this anger inside her own body, she absorbed it all and then she, in return she gave out a song of peace. So that's why her, her voice uh, um, is very peaceful and very gentle and you can really hear that in an instrument like this and this is um, my representation of, of Hine Putahue, she's holding a, holding a gourd in her hands. So very, like, just very different voice, isn't it? Yep, so that's my interpretation of Hine <laughs> Putahue on, on the front there. This has got a couple of finger holes, yeah. And um, for for me, there's no real rhyme or reason. Uh, you know, these are all unique individuals. These taonga, these treasures. And for me, I just put put my hands on it where it felt comfortable, and we oh yeah, that's where I'm gonna <laughs> put the finger holes. But yeah, so that's kōwai waha. And then we've got another little one here as well. This is um, this is also another of Presentation of Hine Putuhue on the front here. Um, so these are called Hue Puruho, containers of winds. And uh, there are there are oral histories 
sheets that talk about these coming across on the very first waka to arrive on Aotearoa's shores. So these are now kind of part of the family, the whānau of Taonga Pūoro. Uh, but back in the day, they also had really, really important functions. So if you were out on your waka, the, the, the tōhunga, you know, the, the spiritual expert on the expedition, if your boat was in strife, well, he, he would know karakia that could influence the weather, that might be able to make the winds less severe, for instance. But if your, if your crew, your boat is in a lot of trouble, imagine the pressure and the stress of trying to get that karakia absolutely dead on word perfect in a situation like that. It'd be pretty, pretty hard to do, I reckon. And they had to be word perfect, because if not, oh boy, you could have really dire consequences. Um, so if you needed a quick release karakia, what you'd do is you'd chant your karakia into a hue puruho. And you would put a stopper in it, and then if you needed it in a hurry, all you had to do was release the stopper, and it would release the karaki. But nowadays, these are used for other purposes as well. So as a musical instrument, they're quite fun. I mean, this is, the hui is actually quite, quite percussive. I mean, it's not, um, it, it will still break if you, if you drop it or if you squash something on top of it, but they are actually quite robust for all of that. So as percussion sound, they're quite, quite neat, but you also blow at the top. A bit like, um, who's blowing across a bottle top here? Yeah, okay. If you haven't, it's great fun, and it's something you can do at home. <laughs> so. so, you know, you can sort of mix it up a little bit like this. And the other little tricky thing you can do is if you just use your little finger and poke it just down in front of the, inside the hole like this, you can use that to alter the pitch quite a bit too. So. So that's quite a neat little trick. Kia ora. Oh, sure. My bad. Does it need to come up higher? Yeah, that might be good. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't have that. All right, just let me know if it needs to change again. Cool. Yeah, so that's Hue Puru Ho. And another representation, as I said, of Hine Puru Hue. On the, on the front there. I should have mentioned too, um, at the end if you'd like to come up, have a really good look, take photographs, um, feel free. Because a lot of this, um, if I was sitting down the back, I'd be like, oh, that, that's, I can't see it. <laughs> so feel free to do that afterwards. Okay. Um, and this one, uh, this is a, a hue puru wai. So this one, uh, the wai, part of the name refers to water. And you've got that gentle swishing sound. Can anybody guess what, what's causing that? Yeah, the seeds, yep. That's right, so here we go, where poo do I? Um, yeah, this one, um, <coughs> I don't know if I should be admitting this, especially as it's being recording, but um, I've found a really, really beautiful image of a painted hue. <laughs> <laughs> on, online, and I went, oh, that, that's, that's absolutely beautiful, and, and tried to recreate it here. There's, there's something suggestive of, of the manu of birds for me in this, the eyes, the beak. Um, but otherwise, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a rip-off. <laughs> yep, so that's where put away. All right, I feel like I've talked quite a lot. Have we got another question? Bringing it back to back to you. Yes. When we were talking before, I was amazed that you could have instruments that are just a straight piece of bone, but actually no holes in anything. You just pick it up on the beach and you can play it. And I remember yeah. when you gave us the demonstration last time. I was amazed. Just a basic <laughs> piece of bone would be a musical instrument. Yep. Yep. They're, they're some of my favourites. Um, 
I don't know about any of you, if you're beachcombers or um, I grew up as a rock hound and an amateur geologist, you know, just going out and finding these wonderful natural treasures. And that's something that's never left me and that I still love about the world of Taonga Pōro as well. Um, a lot of people kind of have that perception that, um, and, and these are, these are Taonga, you know, they are cultural treasures and you can spend a lot on some of them. Uh, and, and they're absolutely worth every single cent. But you can also just, you know, as Moira is saying, you can, you can find them on our beaches, in our rivers. Um, so I don't just have a plain phone here, but I do have this. Any guess what they might be made out of? <laughs> yep, does look like metal. And you're close. No, no, it's not wood. It's been in the water. It has. Something's come off an old ship. It does a little bit. Like a bit of rusty pipe or Yeah, that's right. Kelp. Kelp is used for instruments. Yep. Not this one though. This one's iron stone. So you were quite close. You were quite close. Um, there's a, a river uh, sort of inland from Oamuru uh, near Duntroon called the Maira Whenua River. And uh, who's, who's heard of the famous rattle rocks? You've seen the rattle stones? Well, this is pretty much like a rattle stone that's had the ends knocked off. So it's all nice and hollow inside. And uh, oh, this is just one of my absolute faves. I know I, sh I shouldn't really have favourites among, among the, the whanau that I, <laughs> that I look after, but this is one of them because of, because of how it sounds. And so for this one, uh, so there's no finger holes. So we can change the pitch by, you pretty much just use your hand to form a tube at the end. And by constricting it and opening the hand up, you'll be able to change the pitch. And the other ways that I can change the pitch are by the angle and also the position of my tongue. So uh, let's, I'll demonstrate the hand first. So that makes a big difference, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. Um, angle will change a little bit as well, so. So there's a little bit of play you can get there. And I'll see if I can do the, the tonguing on this one. So it's just that, that if, if you whistle yourself, or even if you can't and you just pretend to, start at a high pitch, go down. What happens to your tongue? What's your tongue doing? That's right, so it starts quite high and quite forward, and then as, as you go to a low pitch, it'll come down and back. And without whistling, but just playing around with that tongue positioning, so much Taonga Pōro playing relies on that, just, just manipulating the position of your tongue. Yeah. But that, that's the beauty, and as, as we're having a little all before, weren't we, Moira? Um, in, in museums up and down the country and even overseas, you'll find these amazing lengths of uh, tōroa bone, of albatross bone, that have obviously been beautifully and lovingly worked. You know, the ends are absolutely ground down and it's been burnished and polished and they just look incredible. But there's no finger holes. And invariably, the museums have labelled them unfinished flutes. <laughs> but for me... Having seen these, and, and the thing is, you know, you've got a narrow range to work with when, when you don't have finger holes, or even when you do have finger holes, it's pretty narrow. But that's because it fits the fit with the, with the vocal music of Māori. It doesn't have a huge range like Western music does. So you don't really need finger holes. So, so for me, I'm, I'm always looking at those descriptions and going, oh, I don't think you're unfinished. I think you're exactly as you were intended to be made. Yeah, so the, these sort of things I absolutely love. The other sort of things that you can uh, pick up readily, um, these are all just off local beaches, shells. And uh, southern Māori, you know, Muruhiku Māori, um, absolutely use these as flutes. And there's, there's no evidence of this, apart from in, maybe a clue or two in their names, but... Um, 
I think possibly sometimes they might have been used as bird callers as well. Because some of the names of the shells are also the names of particular species of birds. So you know, there's no evidence that beyond the shared names that, that they were bird callers. But the fact that they were used as flutes and that you can do it, why not, I reckon. So for something like this, like a cockle shell, if you're holding it up this way, and this is a good one for the, for the grandchildren, for the, for the kids as well, what you want to do is to blow into, into this side here, into this end. So here's a bit of, uh, I call it Kōwowo 101. Kōwowo is a, is a very common type of, of Māori flute. So your mouth shape's really important to start off with. It's almost got to be almost like you're whistling, and especially a low-pitched whistle with the tongue, tongue sort of down behind the teeth is, is probably going to get you the best result for a start. So mouth position, and then it's just all about angle and where you're directing the ear. So even for the flutes behind me on the table here, you know, they've, they've got a bore that's sort of roughly this shape. You want to blow across an edge. Your lips have got to be pretty close to that edge, and then the rest of it, the rest of that surface has just got to be pressed up lightly against your face so that none of the air is escaping. And then that sounds something like this. <laughs> or, you know, these are, these are kāroro, black-backed gulls. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's something that the, the kids love. You know, it's, it's a bit tricky getting, getting the knack, getting that technique, but, um, but once they do, um, yeah, <laughs> it's great fun. They can go out and, and quit it all with the seagulls. <laughs> um, and the other really good ones are um, just a little spiral in the shells. This is a Cook's turban. And these were used quite a bit down here by Southern Māori. Um, the, the big ones are really good as well. You, you see those real big ones like out at Aramoana and along the coast up there. Um, with, with the big ones, what you do is you grind the top. Actually, a lot of them that you see on the beach, you know, the tops are already sort of knocked off them anyway. And then you play them just like you, just like you do this. You know, imagining that that's the top of the shell. Get a big bit of an angle. Remember that mouth shape? just blowing across that edge and stopping the, the air escaping the rest of it, you should be able to get quite a good sound. But I really love these little ones. incredible and um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist I'll, I'll, I'll own that and sometimes you know when I'm just out on the beach you know if, before I knew about Taonga Poro I'd be looking for those shells that were absolutely perfect you know no, no holes in them no, no big chunks taken out but nowadays I actually do look for the ones that have got little holes that have been formed in the shell just, just through natural wear and tear on the beach because these are, these are natural finger holes. So you can use them to change the pitch, which is quite cool. Can I find it? Take two, folks. <laughs> stage right there today. It's all good. Anyway, you get a little bit of an idea, hopefully. So yeah, um, barnacles are also good ones to look out for. Um, and, and the other thing, sometimes, uh, you know, these have these have been cooked. <laughs> but you know, um, certain parts of the coastline, anybody know what these are? Not quite. Lobster. 
Yeah, they, these were these were from some absolute beauties that we were lucky enough to um, to eat um, over on the Chatham Islands. So big, big critters they were, and uh, and they're just they're just pretty magical. Yeah, play from that end. There we go, and uh, even even the old antennae. <laughs> beauty of it too is that it, it pretty much comes down to whatever you can find. Beach combing's great. The, the other things that are really good to play actually are, um, uh, do people know what I'm talking about when I talk about kelp pods? Yeah, yeah just, just those little, um, little pods. Sometimes they're, they're round and sometimes they're kind of that tapering shape. And if you just break the end off and you play exactly the same as what I've just been doing there, and especially when they're fresh. Now, fair warning, they are slightly slimy. <laughs> but, but they are actually the most glorious sounding little flutes that, that you can play. Um, but even things like you know, the rustling of the seaweed or finding particular quattro, particular stones that you, know, you strike them or you grind them together and you just think, you know, there's just something that really hits me about those sounds. And that, that you think, I really, I really love that, or I'm really connecting to, to land, to atua, to people, to whoever it might be. I'm, I'm really connecting through the sound. Then uh, that's been me <laughs> coming home and becoming part of the fun. Yeah. So, yeah, found sound. Brilliant. And, and honestly, I think, you know, quite often, yeah, we're, we're so. Caught up usually by the time, by the, certainly by the time I've reached my age, you know, still very limited in terms of what I think, the, what, what counts as music, you know, and how to go about making it. But if you've got kids or grandkids, take them out and learn from them because they, they don't tend to have quite the inhibition that, that maybe we do. And um, I've learned so, so much from, from the kiddos. You know, because they will just give anything a go, and you, you listen to it and go, actually, that, that's amazing. I'm going to pitch that idea because <laughs> it's great. All right. So that, we had a couple of really great pathway questions so far. Anybody else got anything you'd like to know? So I'm sure we've still got ones we haven't heard too. Mm. You talked about the range of materials that mm. they were made from. Mm. Yeah, great question. So I've got quite a few different materials here. We've already talked about hue, or gourds. Um, briefly mentioned bone. This, this is a, a kōiwi tōroa. So this is the, the humerus bone. If you imagine this, this wing, this is the, the humerus bone. Um, these, these phew, man, the sound of these, these uh, kōiwi tōroa for me is just absolutely special. So uh, I, I remember Rob Thorne, um, I'm not sure if any of you encountered him while he's been down here. He's a, he's a Tonga portal maker and player uh, based up in Wellington. And he, he shared a, a corridor once with a, a group of people I was, I was there for. And uh, he talked about the, the tōroa, the sound of the, the tōroa flutes being, um, being one of, of, of longing, of, of love. Um, and, and, and that really resonated with me. You know, he's talking about how the albatross make life, but they spend so much of their lives apart at sea, you know, years sometimes before they come together again to, to create the next generations. And, and for me, I think you really do hear that in, in, the, in their voices. You know, that mori, that, that life force of, of the tōroa absolutely is, is given voice in instruments like this. Yeah. 
that's the, that sort of that sort and that just that love and that longing to, to me is, is absolutely part of that sound and part of their voice. So these, these ones are really special. Um, and of course, they weren't the only bones that we used historically either. Um, Kowiwi Tangata, human bone, was used uh, quite a lot actually back, back in the day. And there's some really famous examples of, of kowowo, of those short, shorter flutes that, that were made from, um, from either leg bones or arm bones. And they could, be, uh, they could have been the bones of, of a respected enemy. You know, basically, to, it's a form of utu, in a way. Um, but conversely, they could have been the bones belonging to a, rever a revered ancestor, someone who was loved and cherished, and somebody whose, whose mana then passed on through that taonga to whoever, whoever was playing it later on, a, another member of the family. And especially, uh, actually, at, um, at times of uh, giving birth, you know, flutes like that, or in healing, flutes like that were regarded as being particularly effective because it's that we relationship. You know, it's it's fucker papa, it's family, and it's 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 all it. It's they they were just incredibly powerful. You know, for use in, in those kind of situations. Um, Moa bone got used occasionally, of course, until, until the Moa were no more. And I, I can't help but thinking, I, I, I love to imagine that maybe maybe back in the days when the Hast Eagle flew in our skies, I can't help thinking how, how amazingly cool the flute made from, <laughs> from one of their bee bones have been. But you know, there's no evidence that, that Māori did that, but I just can't help thinking that it would have been a really, really cool thing to do. Uh, and stone, kōhatu, uh, is, is another really good material. And there, there are uh, accounts. I've never seen a, a, a kind of an older example, but that there certainly are stories of Murihiku Māori having made uh, like kōwawo, in particular, out of pōnanu. And I can't help thinking how difficult and how much time it would have taken to have made them. But they have quite a different sound. The ones made out of stone, it's a lot uh, tends to be quite a lot stronger than than the ones made out of wood. This a nguru made out of it, and uh, now this one's going to be really loud. <laughs> Apologies in advance. Uh, this is a little karangamanu, and uh, I'm not sure if these were made historically out of ponamu, but they certainly were made out of uh, soapstone or steatite, which usually occurs in the same sort of areas that ponamu does. And uh, one of my favourite instruments is actually a little karangamanu, a little bit like this, over in the Otago Museum. I would love, like, I absolutely desperately love for them to bring it out of storage where it currently is and put it on display. Because on the back of it, it has a, a, a carved bird, which uh, is believed to be a kaka, and then all over the surface of it just these intricate, very finely carved spiral designs. And it's just the most incredible, incredible uh, object. Anyway, this, this is a, a, a current manu. As I said, it's quite loud. So, uh, you know, if you end up sort of going like this, I will not be offended. <laughs> Fair warning. <laughs> So, so we've got Poya Fio Fio over there, it used to call the birds, but these ones do too. Yep. So, uh, and there's some really great stories from um, uh, you know, people like Brian Flintoff, who's, who's a maker, and although he says he's not a player, he, he plays as well. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, where he's talking about playing one of these elements back there. And uh, this male Horimako, a uh, bellbird, came and came up sort of beside him. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've seen them, especially around mating time, where they get quite, quite aggressive, or, you know, it's, it's te- they get territorial. Yeah, they're, they're, after the, they're after the hot chicks. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, he's playing, playing there, and this, this bird saw him as competition for his wahine. Mm-hmm. And, and it's in there, and it, as they do, you know, getting fluffing itself out, and making itself look really big and bold and strong. And this is just this interchange between between Brian and this Cody Michael. <laughs> yeah, just a teeny weeny thing. Yeah, but but you know this this is some some of the beauty of town of water for me is is that it enables these these interactions, these conversations, to happen in a language that is a shared language, because you know, according to uh, to to uh, you know Maori belief, uh, you know we're, we all have the same sort of ancestry. We 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 are human beings. We're the last the last beings to be created. Everything else came before us, and because we're the youngest, we have to look after our, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins. Is that responsibility back? Yeah. So you know we're we're all related. It, uh, according to Māori belief, and instruments like this really, really fall around right there. Uh, and then shells, like this one. We'll see if, uh, well, I've t- talked a little bit about the shells that we use uh, down here in Mūtukiku, but um, conch shells. Very occasionally we'll shell on our shores. Um, sort of mainly up north, but if, you know, anywhere really. Uh, I've never been lucky enough to find a hole on the beach. I found a couple of broken ones, but uh, I live in hope that one day I'll find one myself. And uh, these these were actually so rare, you know, the ones that washed up on our beaches that often, you know, people would know. You know, there was a group walking up the coast to visit people on on a in a park, say. Those people would know exactly who was coming because of the sound of their their putata their trumpet and are so distinctive. So uh, so this one 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 of its voices. <laughs>
learn more about the natural sounds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Very welcome. My pleasure.